There we go. Well, um, humans and robots of all kinds, thank you for listening to me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about something that I experienced as a very young man in the, my 20s. And that was the, the first, um, the first um, discussions about settlements in outer space, the O'Neill space settlements. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the context of, these, uh, uh, of the appearance of these the ideas. So the oil crisis was something that appeared in the period 1973, 1974. And that was caused by the Yom Kippur War and the subsequent um, uh, boycott of uh, or limitation of oil production by the OPEC countries. And that it was an oil embargo basically against the Western countries. And of course it had a big effect on, on, the, on the use of fossil fuel and of course nuclear power came to the forefront. Um, now it is of course not the same situation. There, was, there were nuclear accidents in the interim. Uh, but of course even wild ideas like solar power satellites were discussed. Another part of the, uh, of the context in, that, in those years was that the Apollo program was over. Sort of a letdown feeling, at least I felt that. I saw the last Apollo go to the moon, by the way. And the Skylab space station program was also over. Mm, didn't feel all right either. And the space shuttle was a long way away. And it was, you know, like space nerds like me, it was regarded as a space truck. Oh, it's a fun space truck, but still a truck. And, and you know, astronauts were relegated from heroes to truck drivers. Uh, I'm sorry, but... You know. uh, and so the space activists were looking for something new and exciting. So along came... Um, well, I'll read first a memo that I sent to the Swedish Space Agency as part of some material for, that we wrote at the Swedish Space Corporation. So, there are fashionable philosophies in the United States that say that the center of human culture is moving westwards and from having started in China has now come to California and that the next step for the center of culture is to take the step into space. And uh, in another context, is sort of the... The American, uh, the American idea, which is, um, well, you wonder what was this lady? Well, this is uh, Columbia. Uh, Columbia is the uh, personification uh, of, you know, uh, symbolic personification of, the, of America. And she uh, ma uh, expresses manifest destiny. The, uh, and that is that the uh, uh, civilization in the United States will move from the east to the west. Here you can see her threading along uh, telegraph lines, other means of communication. And you can see that the light comes from the east and goes to the West. So these are ideas that, of course, are in the American mind and still are. You know, just recently, of course, there have been things written about, about manifest destiny for the U.S. space effort. So on the stage of, of, uh, of these, uh, this background and these ideas comes Gerald O'Neill. And he was a, uh, you know, a physicist, uh, also at Princeton. And he applied to be a scientist astronaut, but didn't get in. And he published the, uh, the uh, paper, The Colonization of Space, in September 1974. That was started as a d design project among the students, the kind of stuff that we do at KTH, where Christopher Glissan runs in interesting and fascinating design projects. And they put, they had, uh, tried to answer this question. We should ask critically and with appeal to the numbers whether the best site for a growing, advancing industrial society is the Earth, the Moon, Mars, some other planet, or something else entirely. Somewhere else entirely. Surprisingly, the answer will be inescapable. The best site is somewhere else entirely. So what was that point? Well, it was L5. This is the position in the Earth-Moon system, so-called Lagrange point, where it's sort of stable position, where you can position something for a long time. And that was where O'Neill figured that his space settlements would be, would be located. And um, that is somewhere else entirely. Uh, so after the initial paper, what happened? Well, first of all, he uh, he merged his ideas with uh, of a settlement in space with those of, of the ideas to making solar power stations in in space. And I'll come back to the reason why I was get a market for for putting the space habitats in place. And also there was a there was a society called the L5 Society it was very active in in promoting these ideas. 
And uh, the basic ideas behind O'Neill's uh, proposal for settlements in outer space were there are immense amounts of solar energy in space. Oh, well, that's true, obviously. Uh, in cis lunar space, it's relatively easy to get materials from the moon by electromagnetic catapult. By relatively easy, he means that, well, the, the gravity well is lower than on, on, on the moon than on Earth. So that's why it's relatively easy. <coughs> <clears throat> and weightlessness makes it relatively easy to put together huge structures in space. That's also true. You don't have gravity like you have on Earth. You can build stuff easily. So that's, I mean, it's true, but <laughs> it sounds easy when I say it, but it's not. And then, of course, to build a solar power, build solar power satellites in high Earth orbit could be a steady, steady income source for the space settlements. You would bring materials from the moon and build that. Nowadays, you can talk about asteroid mining as a, as a source of income for uh, space-based civilization. So this is the basic look of his, uh, his space uh, settlements. This is road, down on the right, you see a rotating cylinder with uh, angled mirrors that reflect the sunlight into, into the habitat, and the habitat is a rotating thing with alternating glass or transparent and non-transparent sides. And on the non-transparent parts, you build the, uh, the settlements. And the pressure, let's get into the numbers. <laughs> They're so talking about it. So the, 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 the habitats would be 32 kilometers long, 8 kilometers in diameter, made out of mooncrete, concrete made from moon or lunar material, quartz glass for the windows, of course. A rotate <clears throat> two minutes per revolution. Atmosphere would be the same partial pressure of, uh, of oxygen as on, um, on the Earth, but 50% otherwise of the pressure. Radiation protection is important, and it turns out the walls and the atmosphere uh, he envisages as the protective means. But it's actually so that you need <clears throat> 10 tons per square meter of material of, you know, soil to protect people or infants from, from, from radiation damage. Uh, and this is what they basically looked like, uh, lo looked like in, his, uh, in his vision. I will see a video later about that so yeah, ex to explain exactly how they rotate. Uh, solar power stations we discussed here are two concepts. The one on the left is a thermal de device where you concentrate sunlight on a, a heat exchanger and you beam down the energy by microwaves to the earth. And the other one on the right is, a, is by solar panels and a big microwave antenna. And just note the dimensions, 12 kilometers. Mm, that's big. <clears throat> So, uh, these concepts, well, sort of uh, evolved, and uh, some 10 years later, there was a, another thing discussed, the sp a space economy. So, Bob Parkinson put out, wrote a book called Citizens of the Sky, where he envisaged a complete solar system economy with materials going uh, different uh, directions. And a key part of the solar system to use was Callisto, a moon of Jupiter, which is outside the radiation belts of, uh, of Jupiter, and it contains a lot of, of frozen water, which you can make hydrogen uh, as a rocket fuel from. So this is uh, an extension of this, and the space habitat was a new version called the Stran Stanford Taurus, another uh, variation of the idea. L5 Society, they uh, published, uh, you know, uh, this magazine, and their big, their big influence um, in the world was the defeat of the of the Moon Treaty, the UN Moon Treaty, and the U.S. Senate uh, did not ratify that, which meant that only 18 countries have si signed the U the UN Moon Treaty, which would have forbidden private enterprise on the Moon. So that was the key thing for the L5 Society to make it possible for a business to operate on the moon. Nowadays, they have grown, they have merged with another society and grown to, to a huge uh, number of um, members, and they pursue these ideas. Uh, this is another version of a space habitat that was, was developed by a Finnish scientist just um, two years ago, and it's a variation of, of this space colony. So you see the yellow uh, lines there as the sunlight comes in, gets diffused by a clever optical device, and enters sort of a channel around uh, inside this habitat. This is a, a, a rotating structure, so it's a cylinder. You see the cylinder cut right through, so the axis of the cylinder is vertical, and you get an area 
area which is completely shielded from radiation, but still you get light into it. So um, you will easily find this, uh, this paper on the web. It's worth reading, lots of fun pictures. So I recommend it. <laughs> so well. Um, yeah, I'll show you a, a little thing here, but you know, there's <clears throat> the battle of the billionaires. So uh, there was an event in Washington, D.C. Uh, two years ago. Jeff Bezos was there, and he proposed building O'Neill colonies instead of colonizing other planets. Did he say that to piss um, Elon off? I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting that the billionaires have different visions of how we're going to, um, to uh, populate space. Um, no, I think that's... Uh, after that, we'll see a video showing the, um, uh, what these uh, habitats look like. So, we'll see. Very good. We Earthlings have always been an adventuring people. We've always looked to a frontier to give us new opportunity free reign to our sense of enterprise. The frontier enriched us, generating new wealth, but it also gave us new ideas, new institutions, and new ways of living. Today, the colonization of space offers us a new, limitless frontier. It's bountiful, it's friendly, and it's waiting for us. Well, um, robots and humans, thank you for your attention.